Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to look at income distribution and we'll take a look at the capital and land markets, which are the last two factors of production we haven't talked about yet. All this information is in your textbook, Chapter 20. And we're going to be looking at uh, something known as the marginal productivity theory of income distribution. We'll look at why wages may be different for, uh, for workers. And then we'll look at the capital and land markets and look at the, um, the way to find equilibrium in those markets. Let's start by looking at an idea known as the factor distribution of income, which basically tells us that, um, that the share of total income distributed across various uh, factors of production is, um, is based on that factor's productivity. And so employees receive the vast uh, majority of income in the form of wages. Um, so that would indicate then that employees are the most uh, productive of the factors. Now, um, that generally holds for the for income, but the question then is, does that also help explain why people are paid different um, different wages? Essentially, do wages differ um, for people based on the the value of the marginal product that they um, add or not? In general, the answer um, is yes. That wage differences are. Um, are reflective of the fact that um, at the equilibrium um, level of output, the last um, unit of labor uh, brings in more value in some jobs than others. And so uh, we look at three different reasons. One is called compensating differentials. Another is called uh, is, is looking at the differences in talent. And, in, and the third reason why we see differences in um, and wages and is that there are there are differences in human capital. So when we talk about compensate, compensating differentials, what we're talking about is that unpleasant or dangerous jobs generally earn higher wages than um, less dangerous jobs. We would assume that the skills for doing the jobs are basically the same, but the, the those who do the more unpleasant jobs add a little bit more value and so presumably uh, deserve a higher wage. So for example, a hazmat truck driver um, is a, a much more highly paid position than someone who drives a, a, a brake truck like, a, like a, um, a restaurant on wheels or something like that. Um, it's not as dangerous to drive a lunch cart as it is to drive a hazmat truck. Or New York City police officers tend to get paid more than a police officer in Joliet, Montana. There's a whole lot more crime in New York. It's a lot more dangerous um, than it is in rural Montana. And yet being a police officer requires the same set of skills regardless of where you live. Or finally, like working the graveyard shift at a factory gets paid more um, than the day shift. They bring a little bit more value because they're bringing in um, revenue that most people would not be willing to, um, to do because of the, the hours that they, that they work. Another reason why incomes or wages may be different uh, is because some people are more talented than others. Kobe Bryant is a way more talented uh, basketball player than, um, than Darko Milicic, who can't seem to dunk a basketball. So those who, who are more talented bring in more value than those that don't, and therefore they get a higher wage rate. Uh, differences in human capital also matter. And we know this, the more skills you have, the more education you have, the more productivity you offer, and therefore the higher um, a wage you can command because you're bringing in more value for, um, for your company than somebody else. But there are exceptions to the rule. There are times at which wages are different, not because someone brings in more value, but for some other reason. And um, so the theory of the marginal productivity theory of income distribution doesn't always hold. It begins to fall apart when we look at things like market power, when we talk about things known as efficiency wages, or when we talk about outright discrimination. When it comes to market power, we're talking about unions in particular, uh, organizations that represent workers. And so instead of um, every worker being kind of his own, his own free agent, we have one organization that represents all workers and essentially creates a monopoly um, for labor. This collective bargaining um, power creates a monopoly and causes wages to be higher than they are for non-union workers, not because they necessarily are more productive, but because they have market power to set a higher wage rate than what they would have gotten in the perfectly competitive market. 
Efficiency wages are another thing that causes wages to be um, higher, not because of productivity, but for some other reason. There are times in which firms may pay more than the equilibrium rate wage in order to give incentive for workers to stay. Um, it's expensive to hire new workers. It's expensive to search, search them out and seek them out. So you want to have workers stay. And so some firms will pay a wage higher than what the market um, calls for in order to keep people in position. It helps kill turnover, but it does mean higher costs. And so they're getting a higher wage in this case, not because they're more productive, but because it's, it's better for the company to keep them in, in their position. In essence, it's like a price floor. The wage won't go any lower than this. And so what happens is it creates a, um, a labor surplus. People are, are, are looking to provide uh, labor in an area in which there's, there's not as many jobs um, as there are people searching for them. Discrimination is another example. Clearly, um, competitive markets would eliminate discrimination because if somebody was more productive it would um, make sense then to hire them but um, we do know that there is discrimination out there people choose not to hire uh, productive people for reasons other than um, than their skills and abilities and so um, we do see a difference in income but or a difference in wages though again with the competitive market if the value of the marginal product of labor is uh, greater than the wage for discrimination, workers who are discriminated against, then it would make sense for some enterprising company to come in and hire them. Um, and so, uh, in a perfectly competitive world, we get rid of them. But because uh, we're not in a perfect world, there is this difference in wages based on something less than productivity. So that's that's uh, income distribution. There are reasons why um, there are legitimate reasons why there are differences in. Um, and people's salaries and wages, and there are some illegitimate reasons um, for it. So there are times in which the market tends to exhibit perfect competition traits and some times when um, they do not. Now, we also want to look at uh, the markets for capital and land. They are very similar to labor, but um, they have a, a slightly different vocabulary. Um, when we look at those markets, we remind ourselves that the um, optimal level for anything in economics basically is where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. And when we're talking about factors of production, then we look for the value of the marginal product for the factor of production and look to see what its marginal cost is and um, determine whether the amount of that factor is appropriate. When it comes to labor, the value of the marginal cost should equal the wage rate that you're hiring the worker at. When it comes to land and capital, we talk about the value of the marginal product being equal to the rental rate. Both land and capital have what are known as rental rates. That's essentially the price of land or capital. And so we would say then that um, the price of land or capital being the rental rate, we would look to hire capital or land up until the point at which the value of the marginal product of the last unit of land or capital employed is equal to the rental rate we paid to employ that unit um, of land or capital. So it's just like with labor where the var value of the marginal product of the last worker hired needed to equal the cost of their wage. Um, this time we're looking at rental rate. When we look at the markets for capital and land, we find that the supply of land tends to be very inelastic in large part because there's only so much land uh, available. And um, when we look at the supply of capital, it tends to be a little bit more um, inelastic because there tends to be um, capital goods are more prevalent and uh, can, it can, we can create more of them if we need to. Uh, we'll find, again, that the equilibrium is going to be where the demand for land or the demand for capital intersects the um, supply of land or capital. So in this regard, it's exactly the same as with uh, the labor market. And so um, we're going to do some more practice with both um, explaining wages and the differences between wages as whether they're legitimate or illegitimate reasons. And we'll look at the capital and land markets a little bit more in class. And I'll see you then.